Just had to get that last point in, didn't you? I do want to thank Maxie for his kind words of introduction. Moreover, I think all of us will agree that we want to thank Maxie for being Maxie. Maxie is one of the kindest men that I know. He truly is a gentleman. And, you know, when you think about Maxie preaching the gospel of Christ for over 40 years, in that time he's also developing the mind of Christ. And we appreciate and love Maxie and Fran for all of their work. Brethren, I also want to thank the Brown Trail congregation and the elders here for the invitation to be with you. I want you to know that as far as my part is concerned, I consider this a privilege. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm delighted to be with those of like precious faith. It's an honor to have another opportunity to preach the word. I really think that Maxie gave me in this assignment the best assignment in this entire lectureship. What gospel preacher would not thrill to preach from this text wherein Micaiah says, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith, that will I speak. If ever there was a preacher's mantra, here it is. We need to hear these words again throughout the brotherhood. We need to see the sentiments behind these words in conviction in our day. And if ever there was a time, if ever there was a day, we need more like Micaiah. It is indeed today. Here's what I want us to do this afternoon. Just a couple of things. Number one, I want us to go back and explore, examine the context from which that manly mandate was uttered. And then secondly, come back and emphasize that courageous comment. That's all we're going to do. Examine the context, emphasize that statement. I want to encourage everybody to please take your Bibles. Go with me to 1 Kings, the 22nd chapter. We're going to be reading the context up until about verse 28. And what we're about to see in verses 1 through 4, we're going to describe it as Ahab's invitation and inquiries. This is when Ahab is going to invite Jehoshaphat to come to Samaria. And having come down, Ahab's going to be asking questions. Read this context with me, if you will. 1 Kings 22, beginning in verse 1. It says, and they continued three years without war between Syria and Israel. And it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said unto his servants, Know ye that Ramoth and Gilead is ours, and we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria. And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Wilt thou go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? Stop there for a moment. The three years spoken of in verse 1. This has reference to the time following the covenant that Ahab signed with Ben-Hadad. If you go back a couple of chapters, 1 Kings 20 and verse 34, you read about that covenant. And so this is a time frame. Ahab and Israel defeated Ben-Hadad and Syria. Thus, peace ensued. Now as it says, in the third year, this is when Jehoshaphat, the fourth king of Judah, a good man, a righteous king for the most part, he now is going to join affinity with Ahab. Ahab's the seventh king of Israel, one of the most despicable, if not the most despicable, that you read about in all the Bible. You remember in 1 Kings 21 and verse 25, Brother John Hobbs did such a great job with that context, but it's from that context that we're told surely there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do evil because Jezebel, his wife, incited him. That's the kind of man that Jehoshaphat joined affinity with. Remember the language of Proverbs 1 and verse 10? Wouldn't it have been great, wouldn't it have been much better for Jehoshaphat if he would have remembered these words and said, no, I'm not going to go down to King Ahab. In that context, Solomon says, if sinners entice you, do not consent. Jehoshaphat should have been like Nehemiah and simply said, no, I refuse the invitation. But he comes. Now, 
Keep this in mind. In 2 Chronicles 19 and verse 2, Jehu later is going to rebuke Jehoshaphat for his involvement with Ahab. Listen to these words. Here's the question that he poses to Jehoshaphat. He said, shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Now notice, that is referring to Ahab. Here's a man who's ungodly. Here's a man who hates the Lord. Shouldest thou help the ungodly and those that hate the Lord? Of course, the answer to that, no. Jehoshaphat should have been nowhere near, but he was. And so look, if you will, in verse 3. What Ahab says here is true. Ramoth Gilead is ours. In that covenant that I spoke about in 1 Kings 20 and verse 34, that was one of the cities that Ben-Hadad had promised to give back. But now what has not been accomplished by covenant and agreement will now be accomplished by aggression and conflict. Ahab has one thing on his mind, war. He's going to battle. Jehoshaphat, will you go with me to battle? Now let's look at the latter part of verse 4, going through verse 8. And notice what we find here. Let's style this segment, this context. This is Jehoshaphat's response and reservation. Look at verse 4, though we have the response. It says, And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hands of the king. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we may inquire of him? And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah the son of Emla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. For he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. So notice, when Ahab poses the question, will you go up to battle with me at Ramoth Gilead? Notice, the sad thing is, Jehoshaphat, he commits to Ahab before he consults the Lord. Have you noticed the progression between verses 4 and 5 is all wrong? Instead of responding and saying, I don't know, Ahab, and I will not give you an answer until I consult the Lord, until I find out if it's God's will. No, he commits to Ahab. My horses are like your horses. My people like your people. And then sadly, after the fact, well, now let's see what the Lord has to say about this. It's almost like I hope the Lord endorses what we've already agreed to do. How sad, that kind of reasoning. But again, there is a reservation within Jehoshaphat. Let's inquire of the Lord. Well, of course, Ahab has 400 men ready to do his bidding. And if Ahab pulls their strings, these puppets, these hirelings, are willing to say anything that will please their wicked, their shallow master. And so when they're asked, shall we go or shall we forbear, we're not surprised when their answer is, go up. Jehoshaphat, though, wise, he knows that these are Ahab's prophets. It's interesting, in verse 22 of this context, they are styled his prophets, meaning Ahab's. In the very next verse, thy prophets. Again, Ahab's. These are not the prophets of the Lord. It seems as if everyone in this context knows that. And so, Jehoshaphat, is there not a prophet of the Lord that we can inquire? I love Verse 8, I believe in this context Ahab unwittingly pays Micaiah a tremendous compliment. There is yet one man. Have you ever noticed that? Is there not a prophet of the Lord that we can inquire? Ahab says there is yet one man. And when you read this context, you can fill it in a little bit as you look at this. 
there is yet one man that will not bow his knee to Ahab. There is yet one man who's going to speak the truth regardless of the outcome. There is yet one man who loves the Lord enough, even though he's before the king of Israel and the king of Judah, he's going to let it be known what God's will is. There is yet one man, but Ahab sadly says, I hate him. Not surprised what we study earlier. In 1 Kings 21, remember concerning Elijah, God's prophet? Again, have you found me, O oh my enemy? You see, everyone that loved the Lord was an enemy to Ahab. Everyone that loved the Lord, Ahab hated. There is yet one man, but I hate him. Jehoshaphat says, let not the king say so. Look, if you will, at verses 9 through 14. What we have in this context, Micaiah's seizure and statement. Look with me in this context, these verses. And the king of Israel called an officer and said, Hasten hither, Micaiah, the son of Imlah. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having put on their robes in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets prophesied before them. And Zedekiah, the son of Caniah, made him horns of iron, and he said, Thus saith the Lord, With these shalt thou push the Syrians until thou hast consumed them. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth-Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hands. At this time, while they're waiting for Micaiah to be brought, it's time for a little pomp, a little pageantry. They're going to deck themselves out with their robes. They're going to sit on their respective thrones. They're even going to have a one-act play going on. Zedekiah is going to be performing. He's going to continue to tell him, go up. He made horns of iron, symbolic of strength and might. And with thee, you're going to push the Syrians. Now look, if you will, at verse 13. And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah said unto him, saying, Behold now, the words of the prophet declare good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. Notice what this man, the advice that he gives to Micaiah is. Let your word be like theirs. They've all spoken with one mouth. They've all spoken with one accord. They've all told the king, go up. Now, Micaiah, please fall in line. You know, isn't it interesting that men who themselves are jellyfish, they can't conceive of anybody else having backbone. And that's what's happening here. Does this man not understand who he's asking to do this? Let your words be like his. Micaiah is going before the king, but let me tell you something. Micaiah is not interested at all in protocol. He is not going to just fall in line and utter the same words of these false prophets. He wants to do the Lord's will. He wants to speak as the Lord speaks. Again, Micaiah cannot be bought. He cannot be sold. He cannot be fired. You have to love the courage, the commitment of Micaiah in this context. And here's verse 14. You know it, but let's read it together. And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. Now notice that. What's he been told? They've all been favorable. They've all said the same thing. They've all told him with one mouth, go up and prosper. Now let your words be like theirs. Micaiah says, no. My words are going to be the Lord's words. As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith, that is what I will speak. We're going to come back to this in just a moment. But now let's notice verses 15 through verse 28. We won't read all of this, but in this context now, we see Micaiah's presence and prophecy. He's now going to stand before the king. And before we even read this again, we know one thing about Micaiah. He's not going to change what he is going to say. 
It doesn't matter if he's now before the king. Look at how verse 15 begins. So he, meaning Micaiah, so he came to the king. Now sometimes you hear people from a distance, and they talk well. They talk very courageously. They'll tell you what's going to happen, what they're going to say, what they're going to do. And then they get there, and guess what? They don't fulfill what they've suggested they're willing to do for the Lord. Is Micaiah going to be that kind of a man? No, he's now before the king. Look what verse 15 goes on to say, And the king said unto him, Micaiah, Shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he answered him, Go and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. Stop there for a moment. These words, very similar, almost identical to what the men with one accord, with one mouth, said in verse 6 and in verse 12. Now why did Micaiah begin like this? I think there's an answer. I think Micaiah wanted Ahab to listen. And I believe in Proverbs 26 and verse 5, I believe Micaiah was employing that truth. You answer a fool according to a fool. This set Ahab back. He wasn't expecting Micaiah to say this, this is a man who never counsels good concerning him. This is a man that he hates. And so he's braced for just the opposite. And so when he says, what do you say? I'm sure he is taken back when Micaiah said, hey, go up. Go up, you'll prosper. The Lord will give it into your hands. Notice what happens in verse 17 or verse 16. It says, And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee, that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? I think here's the key. Even Ahab understands that what Micaiah had just uttered, he did not say, Thus saith the Lord. He did not say, The Lord saith. I think Ahab picks up on that. Here's a prophet of the Lord. You expect him to say, Yes, I'll tell you. Here's what the Lord says, thus saith the Lord. That's void in Micaiah's first response. He is parroting, if you will, what Ahab wants to hear, what his false prophets have said. And even Ahab knows, you're not telling me what the Lord says. You haven't told me by the authority of the Lord. And you know what? Now Ahab is going to receive what he asked for. And again, I think here's the wisdom of Micaiah. I think now he has Ahab, and Ahab is really listening. I want you to tell me in the name of the Lord. You answer this question for me. Look, if you will, in this context. Look at verse 17. It says, And he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as, shepherd that have not, as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, Do you notice what Micaiah is now doing? And the Lord said, These have no master, let them return every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? And he, meaning Micaiah, said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, and all the hosts of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, and the other said on that manner. And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him, and prevail also, go forth and do so. Look at verse 23 closely. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. When it says the Lord has put this lie in the mouth of the prophets in the spirit, the Lord put it there by allowing it to be so. Many times in the Bible something is attributed to God, that he has allowed. Here's the case. Micaiah is not content in this context to say, Ahab, you're going to fall in battle, but now he wants these false prophets to know you have just spoken by a lying spirit. 
Zedekiah is going to smite him on the cheek. Zedekiah is going to insult him. Ahab is going to be furious and say, take him back, put him in prison, give him the bread of affliction, the, the water of affliction, and keep him there until I come in peace. Notice, if you will, at the end of this context, verse 28. And Micaiah said, If thou return it all in peace, the Lord hath not spoken by me. And he said, Hearken, O people, every one of you. You know, when we look at Micaiah in this context, Micaiah chose courage. He chose to be courageous over consequences. He chose loyalty over lying. He chose fidelity with God over favor of man. And regarding Ahab, let this be noted from this context, never was a man so fairly warned. Have you ever thought about that? Micaiah has spoken the truth. Micaiah has said, no, you shouldn't go up to battle. If you go up to battle, Israel's going to be like sheep without a shepherd. They're no longer going to have a master. You're going to fall in battle at Ramoth of Gilead. Never was a man so fairly warned. Never did a man turn such a deaf ear to the word of God. We're not going to read this next context, verses 29 through 40. But make a note mentally at least that here's what we find Ahab's defeat and death. What Micaiah has said will indeed happen. Notice something, if you will. This is interesting to me. There's a watchword here in this context that really tells us the whole story. And it's the simple word, so. So. Remember verse 15? It says, so he, meaning Micaiah, came before the king. Look at verse 29 with me. So the king of Israel... And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. I wish that would read differently. I wish it would have said something like, So, you know, Ahab, the king of Israel, and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, repented, confessed, prayed, purposed to seek the Lord, said they weren't going up in battle. But no, it says, So they went up to battle. Now look, if you will, at verse 37. So the king died. Look also at verse 40. So Ahab slept with his fathers. That little watchword tells us the story of Ahab. It tells us the story of everyone who repudiates, who rejects the word of God. So they perished. So they died in their sin. So they could not go where the Christ would have them to go. You remember Isaiah 1 and verse 18? God says, come, let us reason together. Though your sins are as scarlet, they'll be as snow. Though they're red as crimson, they'll be as wool. If you consent and obey, you'll eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. So Ahab chose the latter. He chose to refuse. He chose to rebel. Remember later in Isaiah 3, verses 10 and 11? Say to the righteous... It will go well with him, for he will eat the fruit of his action. But woe to the wicked, it will go badly for him, for what he deserves shall be done to him. So they went up to battle, so the king died, so he slept with his father. I want us to go back for the remaining time. I want us to think together about Micaiah's statement. That's the background. I think we learn to love Micaiah even more when we're reminded that here he is before royalty. Here he is standing in opposition to 400 yes men. And here he is, there's yet one man, but he'll speak the truth. You see, that's the glorious thing about Micaiah. To Ahab, truth was his waterloo. To Micaiah, truth was his Gibraltar. The sad reality today is, I think, even though 1 Kings 22 and verse 14 is the very essence of gospel preaching, 
I think we all understand that there are those in our midst who obviously, evidently have forgotten that. As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith, that is what I will speak. Our young men need to be reminded some things concerning preaching. And when I say our young men, part of why they need to be reminded is they've looked at some of us who are older, who have grown weary, who are no longer taking the strong stand that we should be taking. And now sometimes even our young men are questioning that. I don't see our young men coming into the school of preaching vacillating. They want to preach the truth. They're just like Micaiah. So when I say our young men need to hear this, that's not an indictment upon our young. All of us need to be reminded of this. But regarding preaching, gospel preaching, preaching, my friend, is not about popularity. Micaiah could have been very popular in this setting, at least with Ahab. He could have had probably whatever he wanted to if he would have just bowed his knee spoke in unison, gave a favorable response to what Ahab wanted to hear. Preaching is not about popularity. Ahab said, I hate him. That didn't change Micaiah's message. Remember what Jesus said in Luke 6 and verse 26? Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. Preaching is not about popularity. We need to understand that. Preaching is not about making a name for ourselves. Again, Micaiah had an opportunity to do just that. To make a name for himself among these other men. But remember what Paul said? For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Christ's sake. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 5. Preaching is not about money. It's not about a paycheck. Again, I'm convinced Micaiah could have been amply rewarded in this setting. Balaam loved the wages of unrighteousness. That's why he did what he did, 2 Peter 2 and verse 15. But preaching is not about money. It's not about a paycheck. Young and old men, if that's what you're preaching for, get out. It's not about money. In fact, remember what Simon was told, your money perish with you. If that's all preaching is, is a paycheck, then your money perish with you. Preaching is not about talent. I am not in any way trying to diminish the fact that as gospel preachers that we need to grow, that we need to mature, that we need to improve. But the bottom line is, preaching is not about talent. Preaching is not about trying to be clever, trying to be cute, trying to turn a word or a phrase a certain way. Preaching is not about talent when all is said and done. Preaching is saying what the Lord has said, that's what I'm going to speak. That's what preaching is. Think about this. Preaching is not about preeminence. Diotrephes... 3 John 9, trying to take the position that our beloved Lord occupies rightfully. Colossians 1 and verse 18 tells us that Jesus, Jesus alone has preeminence. Preaching is not about preeminence. Preaching is not about bullying the brethren. Using the pulpit as a whipping post every opportunity we have. What did Paul say? Speaking truth in love. Ephesians 4, 15. And preaching is not about pleasing men, not by any stretch of the imagination. When Paul thanked God in 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 4, to be entrusted with the gospel, he said, so we speak. Not as pleasing men, but God who examines the heart. Preaching, and I know this sounds redundant, but preaching is about preaching. Preaching is proclaiming the word of God. Preaching is getting it said. Preaching is making it simple, making it clear, making it plain. Habakkuk 2 and verse 2, record the vision, inscribe it upon the table, and remember, plainly do it. How plainly? So that he who runs can read it. That's what preaching is. As Maxi mentioned a moment ago, 1 Peter 4 and verse 11, If any man speak, let him speak as it were the oracles of God. That, my brethren, is what preaching is all about. 
Speaking as the oracles of God. Speaking the truth and speaking that truth in love. Remember what the Bible says in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2. Preach the word. That's preaching. And not withhold anything that is profitable. Acts 20 and verse 20. Preach the whole counsel of God. Acts 20 and verse 27. Paul then said, now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. Verse 32 of that same context. That's preaching. It is standing in awe of God and sinning not. Psalm 4 and verse 4. It's standing in awe of God's word. Psalm 119 verse 161. And standing in awe of God and his word so much that we do what Proverbs 23 and verse 23 tells us to do. Buy the truth and sell it not. Micaiah had bought truth. Micaiah loved the Lord. He wasn't about to sell out for Ahab or anyone else like Ahab. Buy the truth and sell it not. Let me ask you a question, brethren. Why don't we allow in our pulpits only what our courts in this land allow? You know what our courtrooms demand. They want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Shouldn't that be what emanates from our pulpits? The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I'm not shocked. I'm not surprised when our own brethren are drawing faulty conclusions. I'm not surprised when they come to a faulty verdict concerning whatever they're studying. Part of the reason is they're not being told the truth. When you don't have the truth, you can't make the right verdict. You can't draw the proper conclusion. It's a lot like Jeremiah 28, verses 15 and 16. What did Jeremiah tell Hananiah, the false prophet? He said, you've caused this people to trust in a lie. You have taught rebellion against the Lord. But again, here's Micaiah. Micaiah, let your words be like their words. They've all spoken favorably. Fall in line, Micaiah. No, not a chance. As the Lord liveth. What my God saith, that is what I will speak. You know, the story is told of a lady that confessed to her preacher something along the following lines. She said, you know, before you came, she said, I didn't think much. I didn't care much for God and the devil. But after listening to your beautiful sermons, I have come to love them both. That's the way a lot of preaching is today, so-called preaching. Someone else described a 15-minute sermonette. You probably heard it. But he said the first seven minutes, the man spoke out of one side of his mouth. The second seven minutes, the man spoke out of the other side of his mouth. And the last minute, he concluded by almost saying something. Isn't that how it is many times? almost said something. Micaiah was not that kind of a messenger, not that kind of a prophet. No, what the Lord says, that is what I will speak. I jotted down a couple of quotes, and I lifted these from a few years back, but things haven't changed, brethren. There are still those, this is their concept of preaching. One so-called gospel preacher said this a few years back, No one should leave the building ever feeling guilty. Now, he was not talking, brethren, about the hearer's responsibility. If he was talking about the hearer's responsibility, I would say amen to that. No one should ever leave the building feeling guilty. If our conscience has been pricked, if we've been convicted of sin then let's be men and women enough to stand up and confess that sin, repent of that sin. No one should ever leave the building if you're talking about hearer's responsibility, feeling guilty. He's talking, though, about the preacher's role. In essence, he's saying don't ever preach anything with much substance. Don't convict the hearers. How sad it is. Someone else said this. Give this some thought. See if this makes any sense whatsoever. 
One man, again, a so-called gospel preacher, said, Our purpose is to leave people wondering if there's a better way after all. I didn't know that was a purpose of preaching. Confuse, I guess, is what he says. Let's confuse instead of convict and convert. I'm thankful the Hebrew writer didn't know this. When I read the book of Hebrews, I'm not left wondering if there are better things in Christ. I have been taught. I now know there are better things in Christ. Yes, there is a better way after all. Richard Baxter, you probably heard this quote. But doesn't this embody the spirit of Micaiah? Richard Baxter said concerning preaching, he summed it up like this, to preach as though he'd never preach again. And as a dying man to dying men. Isn't that what took place in 1 Kings 22? Micaiah understood, as Job said in Job 7 and verse 16, I will not live forever. Micaiah knew that. And he knew that he's talking to a man that if he goes into battle, he's falling in battle. Preach as though you'd never preach again. As a dying man to dying men. John T. Lewis said this, I would rather have thousands to say to me on the day of judgment, we heard you preach and you heard our feelings, than to have just one soul to say, I heard you preach, but you didn't tell me the truth. What do we do with this context? You know, in Luke 3, verses 10 through 14, the people, the publicans, and the soldiers, when they heard John preaching the truth, you know what? Their question was the same in every instance. What shall we do? This morning, I think we're left with that question. We see what Micaiah did. What will we do? And I think the answer is found in Luke 10 and verse 37. When Jesus summed up what happened concerning that good Samaritan, what did he say? Go and do likewise. Every opportunity we have, let's preach the truth. Let's not be ashamed of that truth. Preach the word, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2. If we do that, then we can say, as Paul said later on in that context, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall award to me on that day, but not to me only, but to all them that have loved his appearing. Let me leave you by reading this. It's entitled, God Give Us Men. I think it's one of the greatest things I've ever run across outside of inspiration. Yes, this is uninspired, but notice the Bible truths we find in this context. It's entitled, God Give Us Men. It says, the world today is looking for men who are not for sale, who are honest, sound from center to circumference, true to the heart's core. A man with conscience as steady as the needle of the pole. Men who will stand for the right if the heavens totter and the earth reels. A man who can tell the truth and look the world right in the eye. Men who neither flag nor flinch can have courage without showing it, in whom the courage of everlasting life runs still deep and strong. Men who know their message and carry it, who know their place and fill it, who know their business and attend to it. They will not lie, shirk, or dodge, not too lazy to work or too proud to be poor. Men willing to eat what they have earned and wear what they have paid for. Men who are not ashamed to say no with emphasis and are not ashamed to say I can't afford it. God is looking for men. He wants those who can unite together under a common faith, who can join hands in a common task, and who have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. God give us men.